Hi, and welcome to Decoding AQ, helping you to learn the tools, mindsets, and actions to thrive in an ever-changing world. Hi, and welcome to another episode of Decoding AQ. I have with me today somebody very special. His name's John Anderson, and I want to welcome you to our podcast. Thank you very much. I'm really pleased to be here. And what intrigued me most when we first had our conversation was just the common connections that we had. You know, often this is how we evolve our networks and our lives as we get introduced to various people. And I was surprised we hadn't met earlier, John, with all these connections that we had through A360, through Strategic Coach, all sorts of things. So I'm super excited to dive in, learn more about your experiences and share you with my network and our connections. Thank you very much. And I'm, I'm pleased to have this opportunity. Thank you. So the first thing I wanted to just share with, and it's, it's really nice when people get to a point where they can articulate what their purpose is. And you articulate yours as to inspire and challenge leaders to achieve their greatest potential. Tell me a bit more about that. When did it manifest in that form? Did you always have it or did it uncover on a slow burn? Tell me more about that. Um, well, and it gives a little chance to do some history. So, uh, you know, I grew up in a middle class home or upper middle class home. And my father, as a good steward, says, uh, you know, one day you're going to have to go off and take care of yourself. So you better figure out what you want to do. And uh, so maybe he was planting the seeds then. But I'm, I'm like, I don't know what I want to do, but I want to live like I live right now. And I had no idea how to earn that. And so I was always a hard worker. That was fine. You know, I uh, I was a caddy and a garbage man and all the things you do when you're young. Um, but I'm like, this is really a tough way to make a living. And so I had this idea and it's easier to say it now because, you know, it's after the fact, but I'm going to date wealthy girls. And uh, so I, I did. And I married a very, very wealthy woman who uh, I didn't realize the degree of their family's wealth at the time we were dating. She was very good at shielding it. So now I've arrived into what we kind of aspire to, which is, you know, if I'm really wealthy and I sort of have unlimited opportunities, like I got it dialed in, right? It's, I'm done. So in my early thirties, I'm sort of at the country club and I'm looking at all this and I'm saying, you know, I didn't really earn this. And that's sort of started to creep back in. And, and then I think tied to that was this idea. So what am I going to do with my life? Because I thought this was what you need to do. This is the pinnacle. This is the bell. Yeah. And yet this is wasn't. the result of the effort, right? And you've right, right. had it without the effort. Yeah. So now I got to go climb the mountain again. And uh, there were lots of paths to climbing that mountain. But one was this idea of purpose. And so I met with somebody and he helped me frame it out. And that was around my early 40s. So, you know, at, at the time we would say, well, you know, guys have this 40 midlife crisis thing. And then that's later been debunked. There's, they're saying there's sort of like six to eight transitions in our life. So let's say I was in one of those transitions. And so essentially that, that seemed to be the right thing to do. And it was very anchoring. And, and I tell people, that, you know, to inspire and challenge leaders to achieve your greatest personal potential had to be, it had to roll out of me. I had to get comfortable wearing it like I'm wearing my favorite jeans today. I had to be comfortable so I could walk through an airport with it on my t-shirt. I don't but I could, and it would attract the people I want to meet, and it would kind of repel the people I don't want to meet. So I think where you started out, you know, we've been in these circles, and we've sort of, you know, touched each other's paths. It's probably not by mistake. It is sort of purposeful um, and intentional, and maybe that's part of the key to living well. It is, isn't it? It's getting intentional about ourselves, you know, in this concept of our future self. Who am I? What am I? What do I want to show up as being? And then, of course, at some point through one of these transitions that you talk about in life is, what do I want to leave behind? Mm. And this, you know, transitions that we go through as we adapt, as we evolve into new things, as we try new clothes on. You know, I'm sure that purpose took time that you tried it on in one way until it felt like your favorite pair of jeans. And mm -hmm. that's a lovely phrase and way of uh, thinking about it. And I guess in the last 20 plus years, uh, just over 20 years, you've been working in and around this area of helping leaders, helping CEOs, helping coaches, and you were 
as I understand, and again, made me smile when I found out, was one of the first people, first coaches who joined with Vern Harnish on his journey. And you were right there around uh, scaling up. And obviously, some people may know about the best-selling book of Vern Harnish, which was Mastering the Rockefeller Habits. Is actually that initial piece of mastering business dynamics, you know, and getting involved in businesses. You were one of the brains behind all of that. So tell me about that experience and some of the highlights of that journey, John. Well, and it, it's a good point to bring up. So Vern and I just spent a week together. So every February and August, I take a month off. And in February, I snowmobile. I'm like this avid snowmobiler up to 10,000 miles in a winter. And then in August, it's kind of friends and family. And so Vern spent a week with me. So we've got this long-term relationship and that's why my hair is so long. I didn't get it cut today, but in August, I'm, I'm off the grid. So um, I met Vern back, so as, as I married into this family and I moved up from working for IBM, which was a great kind of career when I was younger. It was, a, you know, IBM had never had a layoff in the history of the company. You know, it was kind of lifelong employment. My father was very pleased at me. My, my wife and my my in-laws were pleased with me because it was, you know, I was working for kind of the Google of its day, right? It was the top company, most profitable company in the world when I worked there. And, um, but my family that I'd married into were entrepreneurs and so I wanted to be an entrepreneur. So my father-in-law helped me start a business. And then I'm like, oh, I got to figure out how to do this. And so I'm reading Inc. Magazine and Fast Company, which were kind of the publications of the day, trying to understand leadership. And I see this picture of Henry Ford, a caption, Henry Ford and Thomas Edison. And it says underneath it, the birthing of giants. And I just finished Napoleon Hill's Think and Grow Rich, which talked about that masterminding they did. And so I read on and said, we invite 60 entrepreneurs from around the world to attend this, attend this program at the MIT Enterprise Forum. And it's sponsored by Inc. Magazine, MIT, and YEO, or the Young Entrepreneurs Organization. This is uh, 1994. So I get accepted to this, and I show up, and Vern Harnish is facilitating this program. And that's my first exposure to Vern. And I thought he was like Obi-Wan Kenobi. Like, this is really cool. I need to hang out with this guy. I need to become friends with this guy. I need to understand the ways of the force, if you will. And so he worked with my company. Uh, that I had at that time. And we sort of started developing this friendship. When I sold the business, he said, so what are you going to do now? And I, I had actually approached Jack Stack with my business partner about teaching the great game of business. And he said, oh, wait, 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 wait. I've got a whole series of people. I've got Jack Stack lined up and Jim Collins and Patrick Lencioni and all these thought leaders. And you can be my first coach. We're going to take the stuff from MIT and take it on the road. And he had the, he had the name Gazelles, but he wasn't calling it Gazelles. He was calling it Master of Business Dynamics. And he was still trying to figure it out. So I was the first coach. And, uh, you know, there wasn't any workbooks or anything. We basically would just take notes. And whatever Vern said became kind of the package. And he and I would go on the road together. And that's how I got my first clients is we spent a week meeting with people he knew. And then they'd say, okay, this is great. Who's going to work with us? And he's, oh, John's going to be your coach. And so that's sort of my baptism by fire. And now I'm working with Vern and coaching. And then he continues to develop the tools. Um, and so that's kind of how that relationship started. And then I would say directly or indirectly, everything from the Vern has evolved from that. So I went on to found the Detroit chapter of the Young Entrepreneurs, which later we call now the Entrepreneurs Organization. Um, my original, when I started this business, it was myself, my partner, Troy, we're still partners today, and Gina Wickman, who went on to write traction and so on. So, you know, it really was, I, to your point, I've always sort of been in the nucleus of these sort of various things. Um, you know, serendipity or good fortune or whatever. And again, the, the beauty of it is Vern and I are still close today. And uh, matter of fact, we got up, we we're talking to each other Sunday morning about possibly writing a book together. So it is astonishing, isn't it, where you mentioned about Edison and Ford and these sort of collections of masterminds that almost feed each other's ambitions seed each other's abilities and capabilities and it becomes a compounding effect doesn't it and when you plot all of these connections like Gino you know that we both know well and has formed EOS for the entrepreneurial operating system and all of these things that operate that um, who knows where the initial sparks of these things are but it's how it flies off and a little spark sets another fire up 
in another part of the forest. But it seems to me, John, that you've been able to be not only in the room, not only in the conversations, but a fundamental component in the structuring and the thinking and the connecting of those dots in your career and your history. And I'm curious that, you know, as we all look to shape our continual careers, you know, we look to redefine and think about who am I today? Who do I want to be tomorrow? Is it a continuation? Is it an expansion? Is it a complete reinvention? What is it of these things in the transitions? What are maybe some of the key transitions that that organization, when you talked about with Vern Harnish, that you went from a great guy with some intelligence and knowledge and a facilitator that like no workbooks, no bits, and it's a make it up, you know, make it real and make it reoccur and rinse and repeat again as it expands and goes out. What were some of those key transitions that maybe not just the business, but the leaders of the business had to evolve and go through in order for it to become what it is now? Um, I'd just be fascinated by that journey from your perspective. It's a really good question. That's kind of cliche, right? Yeah. Uh, and my first reaction as you were sharing it was to kind of come from the, again, my journey and then we'll kind of relay it to sort of clients and their organizations um, because it's not done, I think, to the point you were touching on. So I'm, I'm on the evolution with them. And I would say, I often tell people, I'm on this, call it mountain climb of life. I'm only a few handholds ahead of you. Like I have no idea how to get to the top. I'm intrigued with getting to the top. I'm intrigued with hanging out with other people like yourself, Ross, who are trying to get to the top. Not to say that I, you know, got there or whatever. It's just the journey and the challenge. Uh, but I, but I don't honestly know. I just have gone a few steps further, and uh, and I'm happy to help be a leader in that. Um, so I like the Pareto principle, and I use this often, and maybe it helps. So uh, you know, the eighty twenty rule. So when I was a young man, uh, let's say in my twenties and getting exposed to this stuff and first experimenting. Um, it was Earl Nightingale who made the greatest impact on me, who also talked about masterminds. Again, you know, kind of a, not a contemporary of, of um, Napoleon Hill, but certainly from that, that fabric. And uh, he, he, I listened to his program, Lead the Field, over a hundred times. I just kept imparting it again and again and again. And then if I listen to it today, it's like I'm doing everything he said, even though at the time, there's like no way I'm going to be able to do that. But of course, there's little nuggets of jewels and everything. And one of them was he said, every worthy goal ever set in the history of mankind has been achieved. Now, I was driving like a Trans Am at the time. I had to rewind the cassette because it was a long time ago. And, you know, I got to hear that again. Every worthy goal ever set in the history of mankind has been achieved. So this guy is like giving me the keys to the universe. Like I got to really understand this and, and work it and so on. And um, so I, my first sort of Pareto rule or 20 was that 80% of what I write down comes true by merely writing it down and then stating it out loud. And now there's data and evidence that supports all that, right? It's like 86%. So that was the first sort of principle. Then around 40, I uh, not, when we met Peter Diamandis, but certainly leading up to that opening to that was that 80% of what I know today will have no value in the future. Like I need to be in this unlearning mode and relearning mode. And I gotta be constantly accepting that things are changing and there's core stuff that's gonna stay consistent, but everything else is sort of open to interpretation or, or even rejection. And then as I got closer to 60, I came to this third one. And, and it's really important and, and, and reflecting on before our call, this is one I wrote down, um, that I now have the idea that 80% of what I believe are not my beliefs. They come from my childhood, from my parents, from my peer groups, from EO forums, everything. And it's not that they're good or bad. I'm not saying that. It's just, do those beliefs serve who I am today and who I intend to become? in an exponentially changing world. And so constantly sort of questioning, where did where is that belief coming from? And does that serve who I am today and where I'm going? And then kind of adding on to that, that it's okay to forgive ourselves. There was a great line, I just put it in my newsletter today. It's in my journal, which I'm using under the stack here to hold a laptop up, but something to the fact that 
one of those, I'm paraphrasing, you know, the decision I made yesterday was the best decision I could make at the time, but today I can make another decision. So it's a kind of idea that we're in a constant evolution of changing ideas and concepts and so on. And look at the core. And maybe that was Collins, I think, talked about this, right? Preserve the core and stimulate progress or creativity. That sort of idea. And to, and to the larger question, I've certainly imparted these ideas onto the organizations I work with. I certainly expose them to people like yourself and Vern and, and Peter Diamandis and others so that they're getting the same input. And then finally, that humility and, and um, compassion that I don't have this figured out. I'm just working on figuring it out. And what I have learned is that that financial bell that so many of our contemporaries are pursuing is, is not it. It's a piece of the puzzle and it's an important piece of the puzzle, but it's not the pinnacle. It's not the top of the mountain. And so, you know, what is, what is, and then looking, you know, at whether it's Marcus Aurelius or, you know, there's, there's not a lot of people to follow on this path, but they are there throughout history and sort of saying, you know, go all the way back to um, King Solomon, right? You know, it's essentially saying, I have all the wealth in the world. I have everything I'd ever want and everything is at my command and it means nothing. Well, there it is in print. Why is this guy saying that? It wasn't just, you know, goofy stuff. It was, it was truth. And so we're all on that sort of journey. And the leaders who can understand that, accept that and go on the journey, then are, I believe, are more effective and I did a presentation at YPO Gold recently, and I used I used Marcus Aurelius, and I talked a little bit about him because we get to read, you know, from his journaling, essentially, right, meditations. And then George Washington as another example, and I get to use, you know, um, David McAuliffe's writing from 1776 and so on. So we get to look into the windows of these people a little bit. And then the most current leader is Herb Kelleher, uh, passed away from Southwest Airlines, the founder and, and you know, as a modern day leader. And Herb Kelleher's performance, Southwest, I mean, it's off the charts, right? But the highest performing company from 73 to 2003, $10,000 investment in 73 would have returned 10 million by 2003. I mean, that's rock star status. Yep. People line up to work there, yada, yada, yada. So you can have immense success, financially, business, career, whatever, and what in this picture of her, he's he's hugging one of the pilots in the terminal and crying. He's got tears in the eye because he loved serving his employees and his company. It became just an act of love. And yeah. And so I, again, these are just little um, landmarks or whatever on the way. I haven't got it figured out. I'm not that guy <laughs> so I far. I think so, something that, you know, lots, I can, I can, if we had this as the old cassettes, I could hear the rewinds going to just listen again to what you shared there, John, because so many things from, you know, just a 80% of what I know today isn't going to be so helpful for me tomorrow. You know, a lot of these things of how unsettling it can be. And when you've been in somewhere for some time, we, we aren't necessarily able to see how profound the way we think, the way we view, and the way we articulate really is. You know, you, you've been the frog inside the boiling water that has been in there whilst it's been boiling, and it seems normal to you to be able to think and understand exponentials, to be able to be comfortable in the uncomfort of not knowing what's next. Others that come into that are often experiencing that, wow, this is this is boiling. This is, I need to jump back out again. And this situation of where you said our environment, you know, 80% of our beliefs are not our own and how influential our environment is. So you're comfortable in this because you've proactively sought out an environment that resonates with me, right? You know, about how fast change is going, about getting this spiritual balance between I want more of that, but when I get it, do I still feel empty? You know, is just the expansion the thing, the being on 
the mountain, to be just one step ahead than I was yesterday, to be making progress, to look and expand our horizons, whatever these, these bits may be. And I want to draw to a point and dig in a little bit here because the pace of change is accelerating. When you and Vern were on your journey out on the roadshow two decades ago, going into companies, there are things that are still the same, certain principles about leadership that are the same, but there's many things that are so different, often in the how and what is possible. And you uh, are an author that uh, your book, Replace Retirement and Living Your Legacy in the Exponential Age. So this term and word of exponential, this a pace of change and how leaders need to understand this to effectively navigate and effectively be the leaders that we need I wonder if you can just share some examples of, you said, I'm humble, I haven't got it figured out, uh, I'm just a few steps ahead. But really, there are some principles that you are doing in your practice, that you observe in others in their practice that ensure that as leaders, they are a few steps ahead, so that they're less surprised, they're more comfortable in that uncertainty, and they can navigate this pace of change. So share perhaps some of your thoughts of what you observe in others even if perhaps it's hard to observe on ourselves, right? What, what we practice that can help leaders in their, in their skills, in their thinking, in their principles, in this pace of change that we're living. Um, one of the things I'm seeing, you know, this is, we're almost trying to create a recipe and there really isn't, but to your point, there are sort of insights or nuggets. Um, one is those leaders who, um, when, I, when I'm working with businesses, which I'm doing less and less and more sort of individual work, but I'd walk into a leadership team and I'd say, you are all sitting at this table because you are rock stars at Covey's quadrant one man time management. You can deal with things that are urgent and important and you are like ninjas in that. Like you're like shooting those things out of the air. And that's what got you a seat at this table and congratulations, because you don't mess around on Facebook. You're not, you're not doing things that are kind of time wasters in quadrant three and four. You're in quadrant one. The problem or the challenge, the opportunity, as Cubby pointed out, is all progress is made in quadrant two. All progress. Quadrant two is those things that are important, but not urgent. So the leaders who are starting to understand that and saying, if I simply let this technology drive me that's asking me to respond very quickly and so on, and play that game, which we know there's all kinds of reasons why it's designed that way, right? It's, it's a drug in a sense to keep us using it and driving income and so on. Um, they're good businessmen. Our, our responsibility as leaders is to slow things down and say, how do I create this focus quadrant two time where I'm working on the things that are important and not urgent? And it doesn't really matter which category you pick. You can work on your mind, you can work on your spirituality, you can work on your body. It, it doesn't matter these, your relationships and so on. Um, it's just once you sort of start down that path and you make time for something you intuitively, like I always talk about, I'm trying to get congruence between my head and my heart. If I listen to my heart and mine started with journaling, you know, my, my grandfather wrote a book and was a journaler. My father was a journaler. He did not write a book. Um, maybe I, I'm a journaler, right? It's modeled. And I, I, think that would, I think that would work for me. And once starting that, that created that kind of quiet time and that reflection time. And it was so enjoyable, then it was easy to add meditation and prayer and all the things that I've added that now take two hours of the morning. Um, that is allowing me to slow things down in a fast moving world to do just what your point is. And again, I see that in leaders that are able to slow down. Another one, of course, is, you know, Vern likes to say leaders are readers. You know, that's another thing that slows, and that's physically reading, not list, listening. I do lots of books too, but creating that space to kind of think about thinking, you know, like, am I really navigating this well? And 
and maybe you touched on it and I know we've touched on it. It's like when I first went to Abundance 360 or I met Peter almost nine years ago or whatever, um, that, that there was that shock when he talked about this, you know, abundance, it, it was like, whoa, like, I don't wanna know, just like COVID, COVID is a great example. Some people are like, I don't wanna know, I just want things to go back to normal. Well, there, that, there is no normal, right? So it's not going back. So, so Peter kind of exposes us, here's the new kind of normal coming. You're like, oh, and then the, that next stage is sort of saying, okay, well, I can see how this is gonna affect Ford Motor Company. Boy, they better get their act together because these autonomous vehicles and electric, they could be out of business in just a couple of years if they're not really focused on this. They're in trouble, they're in trouble, not me. And then the third stage is, okay, what can I do? I could be in trouble. This game could shift on me and what can I do? And sort of then that four stage is sort of creating that time, which again, Covey talked about as quadrant two. So I'm seeing leaders who are able to slow themselves down that then it naturally starts to show up in the way they converse with their teams and behavioralizing, right? Because what's there's a quote that who you are speaks so loudly about you, I can't hear what you're saying. So when the actions now line up with the words, um, it brings that sort of calmness in. And it's like, maybe it's the same attraction we had with Peter. This guy seems to know what he's doing. He seems to be in congruence for the most part with it. Um, and I, I'm gonna hang around him. And yet with all that said, there was a, Peter called together a small group before 2020. He was trying to figure out whether we went live or we did it virtually. And he, he pulled us together. And then we had the breakouts and I was a part of his little three person thing or whatever. And I could see even in Peter, uncertainty, a little bit of fear, you know, discomfort, right? He was, he was wrestling with this change and this disruption and how it was affecting him. We all get that. And so I think that's that other part I was touching on. It's not only that I'm doing the actions as a leader, but I'm also, you know, to Brene Brown's credit, I'm being vulnerable and saying, I don't have this figured out, but I'm willing to go on the journey with you. That, those are the abilities of leaders I'm seeing. I think it is that vulnerability and humility. I mean, I had, you know, the, the privilege of a couple of years, every quarter, hanging out with Peter through Strategic Coach. We were in the same 10x group at the time. And it is these many faces that we observe of ourselves. You know, the faces that we see that our peers and colleagues see, to our followers, to all sorts. And the, the reality is, is that we're all perfectly imperfect. Mm -hmm. You know, and the just realization of, how that allows us to be, to exist. And like you say, making space for thinking about our thinking. And that I, I um, you know, I wrestle with this myself. You know, you, we know the right things to do, but do we do them, you know, to your point about action? And we all have good days and bad days, mm -hmm. good days and bad weeks, good days and bad months of our discipline to what we know is good for us. And doing maybe all the things that are good without any of those maybe bad habits of just binging on a bit of Netflix or doing something else. It never gives us perspective of just what that good is. So I think the, this is for me about adaptability and our intelligence to use these things, to choose these things just because I'm resilient or just because I've worked on my grit. I choose whether I use it or not. Does it expand the person I want to become and be? And I, I want to learn a bit more, if if I may, John, about your legacy map. And this is something that um, you know has been around for a little while. Uh, I think it was developed. Was it around two thousand eight? Uh, your legacy map and about yeah. replacing retirement and retirement as a concept in the circles that we uh, orbit is kind of a, a mute point, right? You know, yeah. you don't don't retire, and if you're contributing and it comes me to a, a specific question and I want to link it through from the legacy map to retirement to when in life do we stop contributing is that the moment we die is it you know a decision what's your views on those things and uh, I'm excited from conversations we've had before to share some of your thoughts and insights with our listeners 
Hmm. Uh, well, it's interesting because I was just having this conversation yesterday, so I, I can answer it. But again, like your other question, it's caused me to pause for a moment. I guess when we stop contributing, it's on our deathbed, and um, and that that's okay. I mean, it, again, I'm a spiritual person and believe in God, and and so I think that's the point where it's like I, I'm ready to go. Like. I've had enough. No, that can happen young. It can happen old and so on, but that's sort of, and a lot of people, when I work with them on the legacy map, I do ask questions like this. I take them to the end of their life. And I'm always like, are you going to have any unanswered questions? So where are you, you know, it's the last question I ask, where are you sort of in your spiritual journey? And sometimes they're Christians. I've worked with Muslims. It doesn't matter, Jews. Um, and so then I, you know, adapt appropriately. And then I always goes, are you going to feel comfortable with what you understand as God, or would you have unanswered questions? And so part of that journey is let's answer those questions. So when that day comes soon or later, you're kind of comfortable in your skin, if you will. Okay. So to be at peace. To be, to be at peace. peace. So that 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 would be sort of the, the end of it. Um, but in the conversation I was having the other day, which fits so well, is that we were talking about um, this guy is getting, he's going to step out of running his company uh, December 31st, 2022, kind of step into a chairman role. He's got a young guy who's going to step in as who is being groomed as president and so on. And his wife is not a partner in the business, but um, it's a mortgage company. And she's one of the top mortgage writers. She's got a really great following of clients and so on, but she's kind of worn out and she wants to move on. And so they're trying to get like an assistant to work with here and so on. So as we were talking through this and thinking about it, I said, you know, is it not true, uh, Tim, that you are happiest and most fulfilled when you're creating value for others? Because when you get too much into your own head, then you get all wigged out and fear steps in and uncertainty and yada, yada, yada. So when I'm of value to others, I seem to feel most uh, at peace, most aligned, you know, it just seems to be the cure to a lot of ills. So whether it's me or the leaders I work with, like Tim or his wife, right? How can we figure out in her next stage how to create value? So then that kind of goes on as this replace retirement idea in the sense is like, if, and this, you know, we got to give Dan Sullivan credit for a lot of this, right? Uh, anybody who can synthesize big ideas into simple models, he is extremely uh, gifted at that. That is his unique ability, right? No question about yeah. it. So, so Dan tells us, be a value creator, value, 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 right? So he drummed it into it. So so my role, I it's not just that it's a, a responsibility. I feel like I'm making a contribution on this planet as long as I'm creating value. The beauty of these transformations and aging is I can go from having to do this stuff to now having mastery in this area. And that's one of the things I talk about in my book and the legacy maps around is that what would mastery like that look like? And, and how would that create value? So that uh, one of my mentors, and I have many, is Ari Widenswick, who owns Zingerman's. And Zingerman's is considered the greatest small business in America. It was in Bo Burlington's book. And they're a little deli loaded, located in Ann Arbor, Michigan. They do like 75 million in revenue. And they have training and, and they're just off the charts. And Ari is a, a great writer. And, and he says, John, I can't tell the difference between my work and my play. Now, when I first heard him say that, well, I can tell the difference between my work and my play. But, you know, as that sunk in, it kind of comes back to that same idea. If, if, I, if I'm committed to value creation and the, and the enjoyment of value creation, and I find these areas of mastery, then I would say to back to Ari, you know what? There, it, it is getting blurry. I love my play. I took Vern out. We went jet skiing on Lake Huron, which is like jet skiing on the ocean. This is Lake Huron is a big lake, at least at the Great Lakes. And uh, we spent the whole day and we were exploring and making sure we didn't run out of gas out there and hit rocks and all this stuff. And that's really fun, but I enjoy what we're doing today. And this is really fun too. So, so this is this idea of replacing retirement is that it's not about a job anymore. It's not about a career anymore. It's about a calling. And what and, and that's going to take that quadrant two time to think about where is it that I get energy? So in my book, I talk about two things. You need to be inspired. You need to manage your energy. So what are those things that inspire you? 
And that includes when you wake up in the morning. I did the same thing this morning. I love what you were saying. I, I have those, I'm kind of in a little bit of a funk right now. Like, eh, and I was like, but, and my mind starts getting into fear and this thing, right? All that. And then I up, get up, hit the floor, do your push-ups and crunches, do your prayers, do your meditation, do all, all that stuff. Because one, I'm not going to be ready for our conversation. And two, I just, I don't want to feel bad laying in bed. And so all that is, it's really in that value creation model. So there's ways that I need to create value in the day and in the moment. And then how do I serve in society? And, um, but it can be fun service. Again, I, 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 I had a forum table and it, you know, they reached out to me. I was actually on my break, right? So my email says, you know, you can't reach me. I'm not responding, yeah, yeah. But someone reached out to me in LinkedIn. And, uh, and I'm like, oh, you know, I can't really block LinkedIn. <laughs> so, and it's an EO member in the chapter. And I'm like, eh, I don't really want to respond to this. And, eh. and I pushed to him and haw. And then I contacted him. This is like, perfect. These guys are approaching 60 years old. They're not interested in business stuff. They're really interested in the next chapter of life. And they're like, and then they're going to rent the house across the lake from me on my lake. So I don't even have to go anywhere. Um, we're going to rent side by sides and do some fall color to, I mean, it's all fun. And they're paying me to, on top of it all. Like, I can't believe I get paid to have fun with a bunch of guys and ride machines. And so I think everybody has that opportunity. And I would suggest a responsibility because from my children's point of view, I want them to see that I am embracing life, that I'm pursuing new challenges, that I'm stretching my boundaries, that I'm, I'm not done yet. And to my daughter's credit, my, I mentioned early, I married well, and uh, my children are beneficiaries of that. They each are trust fund children. They have, they will never want for money, and they have really access to excessive amounts of money. Family owns six private jets, okay? And um, so uh, my daughter worked at a summer camp this year that she used to go to. So one of the things she does is she spends time sailing in the winter. She she sailed uh, uh, from uh, New Zealand to uh, Fiji Islands. I mean, she's done. She was on a tall yeah, ship yeah. for like a year. So, but she's got her own sailboat. So she does fun stuff. She's climbed to the base of Mount Everest because of Paul Akers. Actually, she's like that looked really cool. I'm gonna do what Paul did. He's a friend of mine. Anyway, so this summer she goes to the summer camp. And she was gonna lead. She studied all about trees and everything, and she was gonna be like their mother nature person and lead the kids in this nature thing. Well, they can't get their workers from over across the ocean. And so the people that work the kitchens and everything weren't there. So they said, would you be a cook? Would you work in the kitchen for the summer? I, think, well, I don't really want to work in a kitchen. And, uh, but she did it. And then we talked about, I don't know, you know, month before she came to pick up her dog and see us. And she's like, this is the worst job ever. I hate it. And, um, but I have so much empathy for people who have to do this their whole life. This is horrible. And secondly, I am done doing manual labor jobs. Like I've checked that one off my sleeve. And I was so proud of her. And again, it comes from that. It's like, it's like, it's not about the money. It's about how do you serve and what's the best way to serve. And she's like, I enjoy being of service to people. I feel good about myself. Again, she's just watching her father and role model, but I think I'm done with this chapter of my life. I think I want to move on to something else. And she's talked about chartering her boat and so on, but here's someone who has, who's got the golden goot, right? They have unlimited wealth. They have access to private planes, and everything else. And she's driving a car with 150,000 miles on it and works at a camp and makes, you know, seven bucks an hour and so on. And nobody around her knows anything about anything. She's just, and she didn't quit. That's what I said. I like, I'm, I admire you so much. This is like a one in a million. Most people would say, I'm out of here. Like this is bullshit. It, it reminds me, John, a few things. Firstly, I think it was Nick Nanton who uh, shared this phrase thinking quote, tip, nugget, whatever we want to call these things. I'm not sure the origin, but it was a life of thirds. Learn, earn, and serve. Mm -hmm. So in the, you know, poetic dance between those three things. Am I serving? Am I learning? Am I earning? Mm -hmm. And to live life, it, it, what made me think was, you know, someone who has their health has a million dreams. Someone who doesn't have their health has but one. 
So if someone has infinite wealth, well, what is then the dream of that person? You know, and discovering and being able to learn, being able to serve and still being able to earn when it's not urgent. Yeah. So it then shifts to being able to explore the important. So that gift that you've given is for some a uh, relinquisher of experiences, you know, a barrier because they don't have to want for anything. So they're, you know, uh, comfort blanketed. But for others, it's complete freedom. It's all around the perspective of that individual, of how they choose to take whatever event, whatever situation, whatever deck of cards we have, and find a way in which we can be at peace in every day. You know, when we wake up and when we go to bed, but still not being done. So for me, that's something where I can be at absolute peace, but I'm not done yet. Yeah. And so that balance of being, ah, it's urgent. I have to do this too. I have time. I have time. I can choose how I spend it. But like you said, you know, the time on the jet ski with Vern, you're having fun, but you're also serving. You are serving each other and serving yourselves in different energy and fun and fulfillment. And I've observed many leaders where service to themselves is last. Everything is in the pursuit and expansion to serve someone else, but we need to be healthy in our mind, in our health, in our ability in order to do that. And just to wrap up, because we can, uh, yeah. you know, just hang out for, for forever on, on these conversations. But you made a point about unlearning, about trying new things, new experiences. And it's a question I've begun to ask many people that I interview on this podcast. And the question, John, is, what did you do for the first time? What was the last thing you did for the first time? So when you think about, okay, yesterday, did I do anything for the first time the day before? Did I do anything for the first time? So can you think of something you did for the first time? When was it and what was it? If you can share that. Um, well, I mentioned this two hour ritual in the morning that it's been, you know, started with journaling and then I just kind of took, um, Atomic Habits, mm -hmm. James Clear's credit, you know, you, you know, sort of have a reward and then a thing. Um, the last thing I added to that. Well, it can be anything that you have done for the first time you did it. What did you do for the first time? Because it's often one of those difficult things, right? When we're young, everything well, we're doing for, for the first time, you know, we're super curious. And as yeah. we gather experiences, I often find it's harder to find things for the first time. I and mean, we get out of that habit. We stick into our rituals. We stick into the things that we found. These work for us. But actually, that's potentially hard when we're in this exponential world of unlearning, of mental flexibility, and of all of these things to go off and find it because there's plenty out there, right? There's more that we haven't experienced yeah. than we have, but often we don't go out and look for it. So I'm curious to what you might have done for the first time that you can remember. Can be fun or work or anything. Anything, anything you're, you're well, sharing. Um, again, since I just got off this August thing and I was talking about the jet skiing and I think all in, again, I, I mentioned earlier, the snowmobiling is one of my passions and 10,000 miles up to 10,000 in a winter. So the latest thing has been, again, riding these jet skis on like the Great Lakes. And I'm now in the last month, I rode somewhere around 500 miles. So I kind of followed the shore not all in one day in chunks um, up the into the upper peninsula and then finally up to the Sioux, the Sioux locks, which are between Canada and the U S. Um, so that was one of those where for the first time I'm, you know, and this is sort of how I approach life. It's like, that looks like it'd be interesting. Um, I'm going to have to figure out how to navigate it. So I'm going to have to figure out how, where are the fuel stops, which is not a lot. What's the, the fuel, you know, length of my machine. Um, then what's the wind like? Because these are these are not small lakes. Um, and so I'd have to track the weather and say, okay, I was looking for a day they called light and variable with a five mile an hour or less wind. And, um, and then sort of strike out on this unknown journey, um, which is, you know, the navigation piece, which is really enjoying, the planning piece, which is really enjoyable. They're all things I do in my life anyway. Um, the sort of the new thing. 
And then finally, even the, I love the, the challenge of the fear thing, getting over that. I, I had done a run where I, you know, it's each one of these around 120, 150 mile round trip, you know, four or five hours. So I'd kind of gone out and then, and I had to skirt these islands to get out again out of waves and so on. And so on the way back, I'm like, you know what I think we're going to do? I'm going to stay more further north and then I'm going to run down the shore of this island and the shore of this. So I got all figured out. So I'm kind of going back a different way. And I don't have a boat here. This is just a jet ski. I mean, it's, it, it's a nice one and it's bigger and so on. I can measure depth. It has a depth finder. And, uh, and the Great Lakes are so clear when you get into 10, 12 feet, you can see down the bottom and see rocks and everything. It's like the Caribbean in that way. It's, we have beautiful water here. So I'm zipping along and I'm seeing the rocks come up. So, okay, now I'm around 10 feet. Now I only need about two feet of draft, right? And um, so I start slowing down. And then, thank God, there are birds on rocks in front of me, standing on rocks. I'm out in the middle of this great lake. Like, there shouldn't be a shoal here, but in fact, there is. And so I slow down, you know, I stop. I turn around and I kind of slowly idle out and watch my depth and so on and then uh, go south. Um, to me, that is, that's kind of life, right? Is that I'm out where there shouldn't be a disruption. This should be fairly smooth sailing and I've already come through here once. And yet without that constant, both enjoying it, it was a beautiful sunny day and so on, but that always aware, right? That there may be a shoal ahead and yet there are gifts like the birds and they truly were gifts. Otherwise I might've just gone crashing into these rocks and I'm out there by myself. So I'm out on the water floundering around with no help, phones gone, right? Who knows if I'm gonna get picked up? There are no boats out there. So all that appeals to me because I think that's the metaphor for life. It's like, you gotta, you know, you gotta plan, you gotta be conscious, you know, the intentional piece. And then there's going to be disruptions, and um, and I love it. I, I lo it's again, it's like, I just. It, and the other thing I, I'd share in that is that, that's not what someone else would enjoy. Like it, again, when I'm snowmobiling, and my ex-wife, she's great. She always talks about, you know, you love doing that stuff. Um, I'd much rather be doing that than taking a private jet down and getting on a big yacht and so on. It's not that those aren't cool things, and I still, God bless her, get to fly around on her planes. But um, there's nothing that beats this sort of, for me. That's um, your happy place. And I think that's also part of this, you know, as you age and so on, is you don't need to live someone else's life. You need to, to live your own and defining that as much as possible, being intentional about that as much as possible. And then I think to your earlier comment, you sort of attract around you people who, you know, share those similar philosophies. We and, do. And yeah. then you're, you get, you're in the right circles and not the wrong circles. Yeah. John, do you know, your perspective and the way you think gave me a new one today, just on that question. And I'd like to share what that is, because when I pose that question, what have you done for the first time? People explore themselves and think, ah, oh, what did I do for the first time? Something I haven't done before. And what you gave me was a different perspective to thinking about that. And what that perspective is, is we can do the same thing as we've done many times, but we can do it with new eyes. So when we go off and maybe we'll have rituals, maybe we'll have things that we enjoy going on jet skis, but to be present, to allow ourselves to discover and uncover through new eyes, new experiences. So it doesn't have to be a brand new experience. It can be the same experience, but with new eyes makes it a different one. And that for me was just a little profound twist from what what you explained, how you told your story that made me think differently because life is this balance between certainty and uncertainty, between knowing and unknowing and being comfortable in both. And I think I'll give the last word to you as I like to with our guests, but I do want to thank you deeply for the gratitude of our time together. And I look forward to us both working on a very similar mission, you know, of achieving, helping leaders achieve their greatest personal potential. For us, it's ensuring no one's left behind. And that is a big role that leaders can play in influencing that. So I want to say thank you, John, and I'll let you wrap us up and take us home. Well, thank you, Ross. I've enjoyed this thoroughly and I appreciate our relationship and I look forward. I hope you're at 360 in January. I'm booked in. 
Um, so yeah, this is a, a long journey together. Um, and, um, you know, when I, I'll close on this. So I, again, my, my, I'm talking about these um, transformations. And so the beauty of aging is you hopefully get to move sort of career to this calling and define who you are and how you do it. And, and the legacy map, which we reference is a process in doing it. And it's built a lot on Dan Sullivan's work. Um, but one of the things as I keep experimenting with this is I realize that no, I don't want to be fully like not working, but I do need organized plan rejuvenation time. And so I talk about it in the book and but rejuvenation is this um, unplugged, you know, no email, no business, again, what he would describe as a free day. And I find I need, you know, a long series, like a week, you're sort of just getting adapted, two weeks, you're sort of getting into the mode, three weeks, you're like, this is pretty nice, and four weeks, okay, I've had enough. That, that's been sort of my experience. And you do things you wouldn't normally do, because the time allows. All that comes to this conclusion is that it has to be in nature where you're physically challenged. And, and you can do it solo or with others. There's something almost undescribable, but I think everybody can relate to it. Whether you climb a mountain or you ski or what, or you sail or whatever your thing is, there's something about getting out in nature, it being big, you being small, you being vulnerable, you're sort of, God help me that I don't, you know, I'm, this ends badly. And it's kind of where living is. And I don't think it's at all by accident. And I think it's, you know, the same reason that people go up in the space and they look back at the earth and they realize just how small it is and how small we are and all that. That perspective, which nature gives us, is incredibly healing and healthy. And so that's why I kind of encourage these sort of get away, get into nature, let all that other noise go, focus on that thing. and and I uh, think your insight, you just might find out something about yourself that you really love. And that's cool I live. So, Thanks, John. Thank you. Really Rob. appreciate it. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Do you have the level of adaptability to survive and thrive the rapid changes ahead? Has your resilience got more comeback than a yo-yo? Do you have the ability to unlearn in order to reskill, upskill and break through? Find out today and uncover your adaptability profile and score, your AQ. Visit aqai.io to gain your personalized report across 15 scientifically validated dimensions of adaptability. For a limited time, enter code PODCAST65 for a complimentary AQ Me assessment. AQAI, transforming the way people, teams and organisations navigate change. Thank you for listening to this episode of Decoding AQ. Please make sure you subscribe on your favourite podcast directory and we'd love to hear your feedback. Please do leave a review and be sure to tune in next time for more insights from our amazing guests.